All right, 1 Kings chapter 15. There's a lot of stuff in this chapter. A lot of kings and their reigns are, are kind of compacted into this one chapter. A little bit later, we'll be going and in, in looking at the same similar accounts in Chronicles. And um, there's a lot more information given there on some of these kings. But let's get started off here in, in verse number 1, 1 Kings 15. The Bible says, Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. Now, um, Abishalom is basically, it's the same name as Absalom. It's just a slightly different way of saying it. It's, you know, it's a slightly different spelling. And you'll notice when you, um, when you compare, especially between the Kings and the Chronicles, you'll have references to the same people, but their names are spelled slightly different. But it's talking about the same person. A, a good example of that, if you, if you read, um, if you're familiar with Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, you'll see Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadrezzar. But it's talking about the same person. It's a slightly different spelling. And um, I'm not going to go off on all the different reasons for that. Um, they're, they're written during slightly different time periods. And um, it's basically the same person. I think one of the things we could gather from that is that you know, we believe every word of God is pure and perfect and true. But when it comes down to like the spellings of a name or something like that, it's not, it's not this like, you know, because some people really fight and argue over capitalization and some punctuation. And it, did you have S capitalized in Savior or not? And the Bible says that, that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Right? So when God's word is given, they're speaking the words. You're not, you can't see a capital S when you're speaking the word. You, you don't, you know, if you spell color with a U versus just O-R, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's the word. It's the same word. And what we see here with some of these names, and you know, this, this is a whole sermon in and of itself, but like, I just want you to be aware of that, at least while we're looking at this, that, um, some of these names are going to be a slight variation, but it's the same exact person, and it's, and it's really the same name. And if you think of, um, it makes sense with the, the name of Absalom. You ever hear someone say, like, Shalom? This is Ab Abish Shalom is his name, Ab Abish Shalom. So whether you have the S-H or the, or the, or the, the S, it's not that, that different, but that's kind of where the, the name comes from. So um, anyhow, that's kind of a roundabout uh, side point. I don't want to get too far off on that rabbit trail. What we're seeing here, though, is now Abijam is also Abijah in the Chronicles. So Abijam, Abijah, same person. And this is the son of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was Solomon's son, right? So we had King Saul, King David, King Solomon, King Rehoboam. And now we're, we're at Abijam. Okay, and um, during the reign of, of Rehoboam, at the beginning of his reign is when Jeroboam started reigning over Israel and Rehoboam was reigning over Judah. Just to, just to kind of keep our, our time frame in, in, intact here as we get into 1 Kings 15. So Rehoboam reigned for a while. I think it was 17 years. We're going to get into that in a little bit. And now his son is taking over the kingdom of Judah. And it says here that he reigned for only three years in Jerusalem. And it gives us this extra information. And his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. Now, first of all, I just want to, you know, this isn't in here by accident telling us who his mother was. And what's also interesting about this is when it says the daughter of Abishalom, that wasn't a direct, the direct daughter of Absalom. So Absalom had three sons and a daughter, is what the Bible says, and his daughter's name was Tamar, named after his sister, who had been forced by his half-brother in that whole story. You read all that. So he named his daughter after Tamar. That's the only daughter that is recorded in the Bible as being a daughter of Absalom. So just as you'll see references being made to people being the son of David, even though he wasn't a direct descendant of him, it was a forefather, we're seeing here a, a mother being referenced as the mother of, of, of this person. So 
what we, what we learn by that and what is bringing up, his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Absalom, is that what, what the reason why this is even being mentioned is that she is like Absalom. So she is his daughter in, in, in deed and in, in action. So when Jesus Christ, and just to, just to make sure I'm explaining this as clearly as possible, Jesus Christ was speaking to the Pharisees in the New Testament. And, he, and they were saying, you know, we're children of Abraham. And how did Jesus run? He said, you're not children of Abraham. He said, you're of your father. Basically, you know, I'm going I'm to kind of paraphrase this. He, you're of your father, the devil. He says, if you were children of Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham. Basically, he's saying, you know, a child, if you're going to call yourself a child of your father, you're going to be like your father. You're going to do the things of your father. Otherwise, you're not really his son, even though physically, yeah, I know you're physically the seed of Abraham. He's saying, but you're not children of Abraham. So when we see here in the Kings, someone being referred to as being like, he's a son of David. He's a son of, you know, in this case, Absalom or daughter of Absalom. It means that they're taking after their father, taking after that progenitor. And the reason why I believe this is even being brought up in this instance, and you'll see as you kind of read, as we read through, we're going to go through First Kings and, and, and Every so often, you'll see someone's mother's name mentioned. But they don't really give you any other information about it. They just say, this was his mother. And you're kind of like, I wonder why they're saying that. And one of the reasons, I think, is because mothers have a huge influence on their, their child's life and on their upbringing, as they, as they should, right? Uh, the Bible prescribes for a husband and wife, when they get married and they have children, that, that the husband's the provider. He's the one that's working. He's the one that's, that's, that's bringing home the bacon, so to speak. And, and the mother's the one who's supposed to be a keeper at home, raising the children, teaching them and training them and doing all that. So a mother has a very Im important role in the family and one that has a lot of influence on the way that your children are, are brought up and the way that your children are raised. And what we see here is a king, Abijam, Who's, who's not a very good king. He's, he's kind of a wicked king. He's not, he's not, the Bible's telling us here that he's not, uh, he turns out to be a sinful king. He's not doing what's right as David did. And as, as David, his father, did, well, he's not like David. He's more like Absalom. And if you remember the story of Absalom, Absalom, of course, was, the, was one of David's physical children, direct descendants, that was tried to take over the kingdom from him and tried to steal the kingdom by flatteries and, and um, fought against his father and tried to usurp that authority. So we see that in, um, in Maacah here being a daughter of Absalom, that some of those attributes were found in Maacah, which was Abijam's mother. Okay, and um, look at verse number three here in 1 Kings 15. He explained, the Bible explains, in, uh, and he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem? Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So, we're being told here that God's not just completely going to judge and, and eliminate the house of David and, you know, Abijam and completely get rid of him from reigning because David was so righteous and David did so many good things. And it brings up here, of course, that, and, and mostly throughout the Bible, David's going to be put in a, in a positive light. But it mentions here, well, you know, except for the matter of your eye, the Hittite, that was not a good thing. He wasn't, you know, that wasn't just okay with God, obviously. I mean, that was a major sin when he commit adultery and then murder later because, to try to cover up his sin of adultery. So obviously that wasn't right. And the Bible just given mention of that here saying he wasn't perfect. But by and large, his heart was right. So even though David had a grievous sin, a horrible sin, a sin that none of us should ever be a part of, or, you know, or happen, but the, pro the problem is that we are sinners and we have a sinful flesh. But the, thing, the reason why David is lifted up so much 
is because he had a humble heart. And even when he sinned a great sin, he was humble enough to acknowledge it, to get on his knees, to weep, to pray, to confess his sin unto God and to forsake it and say, God, I'm sorry. I know I did what was wrong. God, let just punish me for this. Don't let everyone else be affected by you. And he had that right heart and maintained that proper heart and attitude with God until the end. And that's what God wants from us. God, God knows that you will not be perfect. Now, don't get me wrong. God's standard is perfection. God's standard is high. And God's commandments are going to tell you to be perfect. That is what he, he doesn't, he doesn't lighten up on that. But knowing that we are sinful, which is why he provided a propitiation for our sins, which is why he, he provided us even a way out for, to receive forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. He even offered that, and because he loves us, he gave that to us. But what he wants from us is our heart to be right with him. That's what he wants. So he's, if, if, if sin is going to happen, and we know it is, he at least wants us to, to get back and right with him and, and not to get lifted up in pride and not to just think, oh, it's no big deal, but to get right with him. And that was why, that's why David was lifted up so much, even though he did commit such a horrible sin. Let's keep reading here. Verse number six. And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. Now the rest of the acts of Abijam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between Abijam and Jeroboam. And Abijam slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David, and Asa his son reigned in his stead. And in the twentieth year of Jeroboam king of Israel reigned Asa, excuse me, over Judah. And forty and one years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. So now that's really interesting. And then I make you pause and say, well, what does this mean? How could his mother's name be Maacah? That's Abijam's mother's name, right? But he was the son of Abijam. And that's very clear throughout Scripture that Asa is Abijah's son, which is Rehoboam's son. But um, in, in 2 Chronicles eleven twenty, 20, the Bible reads, and you have to turn or stay if you would in 1 Kings, it says, and after he took Maacah, the daughter of Absalom, which bare him Abijah and Atai and Ziza and Shalomith. This is talking about when um, Rehoboam married Maacah. This is who she gave birth to. Abijah, Atai, Ziza, and Shalomith. So physically, she gave birth to Abijah, Right? And according to scripture, she did not physically give birth to Asa. So it's not like something weird was going on there. This is, this is um, she's probably being mentioned here as his grandmother. And what probably happened, because we don't have all the information, is that his biological mother would have died early on, most likely. I mean, maybe she didn't die, but somehow she ends up raising him and becoming his mother for him, right? And... Um, so however he was born, we don't know who his, who, his, who his biological mother is, but Maacah ends up getting the credit for being his mother and the one who ends up raising him and rearing him. Now, um, what's interesting about this, or I'm going to read for you in 1 Kings 14, is that Asa has to be very young when he begins to reign. Now, we don't know the exact age. Again, it's not information that's given, but his father only reigned for three years. And I did the math on this. So in 1 Kings 14, in the previous chapter, in verse 21, the Bible reads, And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 40 and one years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naaman and Ammonitus. So Rehoboam reigned, was 41 years old and reigned for 17 years. Right? So that's 58 years total. 58 years old was Rehoboam when he stopped reigning, right? That's how old he was. And then if you add another three years for the reign of his son, that would put, that would put Rehoboam at 61 years old when Asa begins to reign. And Asa is his grandson. So at most, you figure... Because we, again, this is something that, that the Bible doesn't give us all of the various ages they were when they were born and everything else like it does with some other people. But if you figure, if Rehoboam was 20 years old when he had Abijah, which he probably wasn't, because you can see that he had other wives and other children, but his favorite wife was Maacah. 
and Abijah was his firstborn from her. And from the context, you could tell that probably wasn't his firstborn. But let's say he was 20 years old, right? Well, if his son was, if Abijah was 20 years old, then when he had Asa, then that would put Asa around 20 years old, right? Now, and that's, that's just using some made-up numbers. But it probably, well, he probably wasn't that young when he had his first one. So Asa is probably in his teens, I'm guessing, when he becomes a, a king here. And we also get a little bit of an indication, too, that Maacah, because Maacah is brought up multiple times, and it says that Maacah became a queen, was a queen. Now, nowhere in Scripture does God outline the, the role of a queen. First of all, God, doesn't, God didn't plan on having any kings or any kingdom. It was supposed to be God is the king, his law stands, and the judges ruled, you know, ma judged God's laws appropriately according to what happened between people. And they would pass judgment according to God's law with God being in charge and God being a king. That's the nation that God planned and designed. But when God knew that eventually they're going to forsake him as being king and they're going to set up their own worldly king, their own human king in, in, in his place, he also laid out some rules in, in the law, in the law of Moses, saying, okay, if you're going to have a king, this is the way the king needs to be. But nowhere in, in any of God's law does he say anything about a queen. Nowhere does he say that the king's wife is a queen or the king's mother is the queen or anything like that or that any queen has any authority. I mean, the Bible teaches actually the opposite. The Bible teaches that the, uh, that the woman is not to usurp the authority of the man. So if you have a woman in charge and a woman ruling, she's usurping that authority. And what we see here is that uh, Maacah was a queen. And a little bit later in the chapter, Asa has to remove her from having that position or that office of being the queen because she had set up some idols. But what, you know, I'm kind of going a little bit farther. One of the things that Maacah was probably involved in was the ruling, though, and helping that young Asa as he's younger to get, be established in the throne with her being queen because... His dad's dead and his grandfather's dead, right? So since, since his dad had such a short reign, just a couple years, and, and died a lot earlier, um, Asa had to kind of pick up pretty young. And as a result, Maacah was, was kind of in that office of being a queen. But what, what's interesting about this, though, is that Asa turns out to be a good king. He turns out to be a righteous man of God. He turns out to have his heart right with God. His dad, dad not so much. Mom, or the one given the credit for, for being, you know, raising him, her not so much either. And I just previously said, you know, the mother has a big impact and influence on their children's life, and that is absolutely true. But one thing else that we can learn about this is that even in the worst of circumstances, even in the worst situations, ultimately, at the end of the day, we all have our own decisions to make in life. Now, yes, parents help mold and fashion and shape their children. But even in a situation where you have a wicked mother, a wicked father, you can still make choices for yourself to do what's right. You can still say, I'm going to serve God. You can say, my mother may be a, a Hittite, my father an Amorite, but I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to do things right. And, and praise God for that. It's nice to see that in the Bible where people don't have the best upbringing. They're not coming from, you know, what we would consider a Christian home. Right? Praise God for the Christian homes. Praise God for the children that are growing up that have, you know, a loving parents and, and showing them the truth from the Bible and giving them that great head start and, and showing them how to avoid all these pitfalls and, and, and really getting them grounded in the Word of God. That makes a big impact on a child's life. Absolutely. But just because you, you don't have to lose all hope for people that don't have that upbringing. And we see that here with Asa. We see that we still have that opportunity that even though a mother has a great influence, it's not set in stone. It's not just 100%. Well, they're just doomed. We all have free will. You can choose whether you want to live a good life or a wicked life. You may have some more obstacles. You may have some more difficulties and challenges to overcome, but you can still do it. Ace is an example of that. Let's keep reading here in verse, uh, 1 Kings 15. Look at verse number 11. But says, and Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. And that's why that's what I was saying before. It's, he's, it's referring to David as being his father. He's comparing Asa to David. 
And he's saying Asa did that which was right, just like David did. Verse 12, and he took away the sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his father had made. Now, I'm not going to re-preach what I just did a couple weeks ago on the sodomites. We, we, what we see here is really interesting and it's really telling. And if anyone is honest with themselves and they want to know what the Bible teaches about this subject of homosexuality and sodomy, it's very clear in the Bible that it, it follows up verse number 11 that says, Asa did that which was right. How did he do that which was right? Well, the next verse says, he took the sodomites out of the land. That's what he did that was right. That's one of the things that he did that was righteous. He didn't say, Sodomites, everyone welcome, come in and, and join me and we're all going to hold hands and pray together. He didn't do that. That's what the world's going to try to tell you that we ought to be doing with the Sodomites today. But when he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, he got them out of the land. Why? Because they're toxic. He said, get rid of this. Get rid of this filth and perversion. We don't have anything to do with it. Get them out of the land. And also what I want to point out here though, and, and you're going to find this all throughout Scripture to the point where it's almost inseparable. You notice it says he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols. The connection between the idolatry and the, the sodomy is, is all throughout Scripture. The rejection of God and building a false idol is a, there's, a, there's a great correlation between how much sodomy there is too. Even in the land of Sodom, it says in Ezekiel that, that, um, they were, that one of their main sins was idolatry. And they had idleness, of, you know, abundance of bread and idleness, and they were given over to idolatry. Which makes sense because Romans 1 explains that the person that, that you know, ref refuses to, to acknowledge God and, and doesn't want to retain God in their knowledge, they, are, um, they worship and serve the creature more than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. And they, they get start off getting involved in idolatry before they're given over to that reprobate mind and become sodomites. So you see that all throughout the scripture. And it's important, you know, when we remember this, say, oh, but there's no idolatry today. Be, be careful about that. Because the more idolatry is allowed, the more it, 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 it is introduced into a culture, the more wicked that it's going to become quickly. And for all the sins that you see are done throughout history in the Bible and biblical history, when God really brings his judgment down, you know what it's for? It's for forsaking him and going after false gods. That's why. I mean, the children of Israel have done many, many sins and is, and is recorded as doing very many sins. But as soon as they just completely turn their back on God and just say, you know what? These are our gods. We're going to worship and serve the gods of the heathen. That's when God brings the judgment. Why? Because God's a jealous God. Why? Because the first two commandments, the very first two of the Ten Commandments are the ones that say, I'm the Lord your God. You don't worship any other God but me. Don't even make any, gold, you know, any graven images. Don't bow down to them. Don't worship them. You worship me. Number one and number two, that's it. And he continues on with more, but there's a, th those are in the number one and number two spot for a very good reason, because God holds those to be of utmost importance. King Asa, I, li I, li I like his start from the beginning. He takes the Sodomites out of the land and he gets rid of the idols. He says, well, you know what? As a nation, we're getting our hearts back right with God. And if, you, if you're looking for any type of redemption in this country, it's not going to come through politics. It's not going to come from a man saying, I've got these great policies and here's what we're going to do with health care and here's what we're going to do with this and here's what we're going to do with that. It's going to say, we're going to get our hearts right with God. We're going to get the sin and perversion and filth and wickedness out of this thing. We're not going to allow this stuff anymore. We're going to kick the sodomites out. We're going to get things right. We're going to get our heart right with God and then maybe we can be established and think about moving forward and, and God blessing us. Because everything else, you're just spinning your wheels. It's vanity. Asa did that which was right. Verse number 13, And also Maacah his mother, even her he removed from being queen. So here's a reference I was talking about when he removed her from being queen, because she had made an idol in a grove. And Asa destroyed her idol and burnt it by the brook Kidron. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. Now, keep this in mind. Asa had a job to do. Asa was doing what was right by God. And 
maybe this will help some of you because I've, I've heard people kind of not know what to do. You know, the Bible says that we need to honor our father and mother, right? Amen and amen. It's one of the Ten Commandments, and it's a very important commandment. We ought to honor our parents, honor your father and mother. And yes, that means to respect them. I believe it also is, is referring to taking care of them financially when they get older and, 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 and looking out for them and making sure that they're taken care of. That's part of honoring them. But when it comes down to mom's got this idol versus I need to honor my father and mother, Asa destroyed that idol. Isaac said, nope, nope, this is, this, is, this is in contradiction to God's word. You can't have this. You know, he could have respect for his mother, but he's not going to allow that sin. He's not going to allow the idol just to stand, and he's not going to allow her to usurp his own authority, being the king, and just allow this, this stuff and give her a pass at that. When it comes to us in our own daily lives, you know, you honor your parents, you honor your father and mother, but we have to serve God first. There's a lot of people, you know, and unfortunately people are in, in different situations. Sometimes there's younger people, sometimes there's older people, and you might be living under, you know, with your parents, which is a, a very, you definitely got to be honoring and respecting your parents' wishes. But if they tell you, you can't go to church, you can't read your Bible, you can't do this, you know what? That's the point where you say, I am going to do that because God said so. That's the point where you say, I'm not going to obey what man, you know, I'm not going to fear what man could do to me. I'm going to fear what God could do to me, and I'm going to obey God rather than man. We always have to make sure that we have a good understanding and a good concept of people's scope and their realm of authority over us in our life. God gave the government a certain set of rules and a certain authority and a certain power to punish evildoers. That's what, that's what God the, actually gave authority for government to handle that, to handle the, the treatment of criminals, to give them their sentences that are just. That is a power given by God, but God didn't give the government the authority to tell you how much soda you could drink. God didn't tell you, give the government authority to tell you when you need to go to bed and when you need to wake up and, and how, you know, if you can go out and you have a curfew and all this other stuff. God didn't give the government that authority. So if the government is... is exerting that type of power and trying to give you those types of laws, they're acting outside of the scope of God's power. And I don't believe that we are required to just obey every single law that a government comes up with just because it's a government. We just need to obey the authority that God has given to them. And as soon as they go outside of that authority, we don't need to worry about it. God's given the authority of, of the parents in the home. Specifically, the father having the most authority within the home. And, and the parents and the wife. The wife is supposed to be in submission to the husband, and the children are supposed to be in submission to their parents, and, and supposed to do what they're told. But I'll tell you what, as soon as the dad steps outside of his boundaries and outside of his authority and, and starts you know, delving into areas that God hasn't given him power over, you don't need to listen to that. And we see that here with King Asa. He, didn't, he wasn't a respecter of persons, with, even with his own mother. And he, didn't, he, didn't, uh, he, he handled the conflict appropriately by saying, no, the idol's got to go. I'm going to stamp it. We're going we're gonna to get rid of it. And, um, and it's done. Now, one of the things that's interesting here is that in verse 14, the Bible says, but the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. I was actually studying out for a different sermon, and I've seen there's, there's some differences. Keep your finger here in 1 Kings 15. Turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 14. We're going to be kind of spending some time now for the majority of the rest of the sermon, flipping back and forth between 2 Chronicles and 1 Kings. So try to keep a bookmark in each place when I tell you to, to, to look back and forth. And I'm bringing this up because, you know, I, I want to make sure that it's clear so that if you read it later, you're like, whoa, wait a minute, what's that? It, it, you, could, you could hear the explanation as to why there might be some, some small differences between 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. It's not a contradiction. Um, they're, just, they're just stating from different points of view. But um, 2 Chronicles 14, look at verse number 2. Bob reads, And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. For he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places 
and break down the images and cut down the groves. So you say, wait a minute. I thought, you know, in 1 Kings 15 it says the high places were not removed, but then it says in 2 Chronicles 14 that he did take away the high places. So which is it? Well, look at verse number 5 in 2 Chronicles 14, where you're at. Also he took away out of all the cities of Judah the high places and the images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. Now flip over to chapter 15 of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 15. And look at verse number 17, because this is still talking about Asa. The Bible says, But the high places were not taken away out of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all his days. So he didn't get rid of all of the high places. He did get rid of some of the high places. He got rid of some of the high places, specifically in Judah, you know, near Jerusalem. He got rid of those high places, but he didn't get rid of all of them. So when it says that the high places were not removed, they weren't completely removed in 1 Kings. But he did take, get rid of some of them. He was getting rid of some of the idols, and, but he just didn't do a complete job. And you're going to find out later that with his son Jehoshaphat, he didn't get all of the sodomites out of the land either. We saw here it said that he got the sodomites out of the land, but Jehoshaphat comes and it says, you know, the sodomites that were left in the land, he got rid of those too. So he, he's doing a big job here. You got to think about it. The, the, the country's already started to degrade and you've had a couple of wicked kings and, and, and real quickly, the, you know, the, things are kind of getting out of control. So he's, he's kind of resetting things back to God. But when he's doing it, he, he's not just being thorough, 100% getting everything done. He's doing a big sweeping change and kind of getting as much as he can, right? And that's what's going on here. So he did get rid of some of the high places, but he didn't get all of them out. And, that, and that's the point. So when you look at this, don't be like, oh, well, which one is it? Did he remove them or not? See where it's kind of it's a stupid thing. And people want to nitpick at, at things like this, but it, it makes perfect sense. It just depends on how you're looking at it. Are they removed completely or, um, or not? So let's go back to uh, 1 Kings 15. And also, even though, so basically, in verse 14 there, in 1 Kings 15, it says, but the high places were not removed. Asa was doing all these great things. Okay, so he missed some of the high places. The Bible still says, nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. So God is caring about the heart. His standard is perfection, but he understands that we are not perfect. And what he really cares the most about is what's on the inside. He, he cares the most about your heart. So it's not like God's just, just waiting for you to, to mess up. Like, oh, you didn't take all the high places out. I'm just going to come down on you for that. He was doing a lot of really good stuff. So there's a few shortcomings. We're all going to have some shortcomings. But he was, he, his heart was right with the Lord. And, and the Bible recognizes that. God recognizes that and gives him credit for that and says that he was a righteous king. Look at verse number 15 there in 1 Kings 15. And he brought in the things which his father dedicated and the things which himself had dedicated into the house of the Lord, silver and golden vessels. And there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. Now, 1 Kings is giving a very brief description of Asa's life in general. But in 2 Chronicles, he has three chapters dedicated to his life. So I'm going to spend some of the time tonight going a little bit more in depth into Asa's life because he's a really interesting person and, and is, had really did a lot of, of various things and he's considered a righteous king. So I think it's, it's worth taking a little bit of the time. Turn back, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 14. We're going we're gonna to see um, a lot more here. 1 Kings 15 does, I mean, it, it kind of is like blowing through these various kings. Even Abijah has like a chapter in 2 Chronicles, even though here he's got a few verses. So it's, it's really going through because in 1 Kings, 1 Kings spends a lot more time on Elijah. So we're going to be getting into Elijah too. It's kind of going through um, Sequentially, it's going through chronologically these reigns of the kings and then spending more time in various areas. And that's what's great about the Bible. You know, you've got first and second kings and first and second chronicles basically covering the same time frame, and you're getting completely different information from both of them. A lot of time spent here versus a lot of time spent there. So it even, you know, it's it doesn't feel like you're just reading the same exact thing over and over again. And it's also cool to, to take them and put them side by side and put the whole, all the pieces together to get the full picture of what's going on in these guys' lives. 
So the things that, that 1 Kings 15 kind of briefly mentions, we're going to go a little bit more in depth when it comes to Asa. So 2 Chronicles 14, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord of his God. For he took away the altars of strange gods in the high places, and brake down the images, and cut down the groves, and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers, and to do the law and the commandment. Also he took away out of all the cities of Judah the high places and the images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. That's interesting. He's, he's getting the, the heart of the people right with God. He gets rid of all the sin and the wickedness, and all of a sudden, God gives him peace. Peace of God. God protects them. God's looking over them because their heart was right. That's where the peace comes from. That's where, where our strength will come from is by turning to the Lord. Look at verse number six. And he built fenced cities in Judah, for the land had rest. And he had no war in those years because the Lord had given him rest. We live in a time where there seems like there's just perpetual warfare. There's always war going on. Well, you can expect that to happen when you don't have a people that are just seeking the Lord and seeking his righteousness and sticking to his laws. Because when you have a people like that, guess what? You're going to experience a great time of peace. God's going to be looking out for you. God will fight your battles for you. God will give you rest when you're seeking him and his ways. Look at verse number seven. Therefore he said unto Judah, let us build these cities and make about them walls and towers, gates and bars, while the land is yet before us, because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought him and he hath given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. And notice, Asa's given all the credit to God anyways. It's easy, it seems easy for these kings to be able to take the, you know, get lifted up in their own pride and in themselves, thinking, wow, look at all these great things that I did. Oh, I'm such a great king. That's why we have peace. Oh, people are scared of me because I'm building up this army and we're building all these walls and stuff and that's why they don't want to mess with me. He's saying, no, God, you know, we're seeking after God and God's given us, he's blessing us with his peace. So let's make the most of it. Let's prosper. Let's build up walls. Let's, let's do our best and, uh, and, and, and praise God for what he's done for us. Verse number eight. And Asa had an army of men that bear targets and spears. Out of Judah, 300,000. And out of Benjamin that bear shields and drew bows, 204 score thousand. All these were mighty men of valor. So he's got about 580,000 warriors. Right? Look at verse number nine. And there came out against them Zira the Ethiopian, with an host of a thousand thousand and three hundred chariots and came unto Mauritian. A thousand thousand. It's a million. A million people. That's a lot. And they're basically outnumbered two to one. Because he's got 500, you know, um, Ace has got 580,000 troops, right? We just got that from the previous verse. You add them up. And now this Ethiopian Zira, Zira is coming out against them with a million troops. Twice as many people. You're facing odds like that as, as, a, as a general, as an army commander, you're going like, what are we going to do here? Because that's, outnumbered two to one is, is pretty significant. I mean, we're not talking about 10%, 20%. You're talking about 100% being outnumbered. They've got twice as many people as we do. And they've got 300 chariots. Because the chariots were, were a significant fighting force in those days. Look at verse number 10. Then Asa went out against him, and they set the battle in array in the valley of Zephatha at Marisha. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God, let not man prevail against thee. Every single time you see a person in the Bible making statements like this and completely relying on God, you know what happens 100% of the time? God wins. 100% of the time, Whoever is, is, is seeking the Lord as just 100% relying on him, giving God the credit, giving God the credit, you know what? We're outnumbered two to one, God, but you know what? You can do everything. Whether we have a lot of people, whether we have no people, whether we have no power at all, God, you have the power to take care of this and we're going to rely on you. Help us now, God. David said the same thing going up against Goliath. He said the same thing when he had killed the, the lion and the bear when he was watching over the sheep. God gave me the strength. God delivered them into my hand. And God's going to deliver this heathen, this uncircumcised Philistine into my hand. 
I don't care that he was raised from a youth to be a warrior. I don't care that he's twice as big as me. I don't care that he's got a staff like a weaver's beam. Doesn't matter. I've got God. God is bigger than any man and any warrior than any obstacle. And he had that faith and that confidence to win the victory. And it wasn't through him, it was through God. Don't get me wrong, it's not what he did. And every single time, you will not find one story in the Bible that talks about someone calling out to God for a great victory and God just saying, nope. Every single time. You look at Joshua. And he's going out and fighting. And he commanded the sun to stand still. God did it. God listened to him. Every time. And we see Asa here. And he's great. I love these attitudes. Man, would to God we could have more men that would have this attitude just relying 100% on God. Amen. Say, I don't know what's going to happen, God, but we know that you can help us. And if you help us, no one can stand up against us. I don't care. They could have a billion people. Doesn't matter. Verse number 12. So the Lord smote, look at, the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah. And the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people that were with him pursued them unto Gerar, and the Ethiopians were overthrown that they could not recover themselves for they were destroyed before the Lord and before his host and they carried away very much spoil. They were, they were beaten so badly that they couldn't even recover from it. I mean, they suffered such significant loss of their million man army that they couldn't even, they couldn't come back from that. They were decimated. Why? Because God fought for his children because they relied on him. Verse number 14, and they smote all the cities round about Gerar, for the fear of the Lord came upon them, and they spoiled all the cities, for there was exceeding much spoil in them. They smote also the tents of cattle and carried away sheep and camels in abundance and returned to Jerusalem. So God gives them this great victory. Keep your place here in 2 Chronicles. Turn back, if you would, to 1 Kings 15. 1 Kings 15, we're going to go a little bit farther in, in our progression here. We're going to pick up where we left off, verse number 17 of 1 Kings 15. And Baasha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might not suffer any to go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. So, and the reason why I'm doing this is what we just read in 2 Chronicles 14. I'm keeping in like chronological order here. So, what's happening now with Baasha is happening after he's already won this great victory against the Ethiopians. Okay, so just keep that in mind. That, that, that this is the way that, that, that we're doing this. Now, we've got Jeroboam's done. Baasha has killed Jeroboam, and he kills off his whole household. Baasha now is the king of Israel, and he's going to make war against Judah. So verse 17, And Baasha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might not suffer any to go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa took all the silver and the gold, that were left in the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and delivered them into the hand of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tabrimon, the son of Hezion, king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There is a league between me and thee and between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent unto thee a present of silver and gold. Come and break thy league with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. So Ben-Hadad hearkened unto King Asa and sent the captains of the hosts, which he had against the cities of Israel, and smote I, John, and Dan, and Abelbeth, Maacah, and all Sinaroth, and with all the land of Naphtali. And it came to pass when Baasha heard thereof that he left off building of Ramah and dwelt in Tirzah. Then King Asa made a proclamation throughout all Judah. None was exempted. And they took away the stones of Ramah and the timber thereof, wherewith Baasha had builded. And King Asa built with them Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah. So turn now, if you would, to Second Chronicles chapter 16, because this same event is recorded there. And we're going to get a little bit even more information about this, about what happens here. So right after we see, and you know, I don't know how many years had passed, but Asa has this great victory over the Ethiopians because he relied on God. And it didn't matter that he was outnumbered. He completely relied on God and God delivered him. And he saw that. He saw God win the battle for him. I mean, that should be really encouraging. But now he's facing Baasha. Baasha comes out and just starts troubling him. And it doesn't even say he came down with a million people. He just comes down and he starts trouble. You know, he starts building around and, and not allowing you know, people to come and go through one of his cities. And 
instead of turning to God and going out to fight, this time Asa turns to another country. He turns to Syria. And he says, you know what, Syria? We've got a league. We've got a pact, right? We've got this pact where, where if anyone, you know, we're going to defend you, you're going to defend us, so we're calling on, on you now. Here's some money. We're going to send you some resources. We're going to send you some money. Break your league with Israel and just side with us. Help us out so that we can get rid of Baasha, right? And they do that. So he hires them, but he hires them with the money out of the house of God. So now, instead of relying on God, he's stealing from God to let man help him out. Relied on God, God would have saved him again. There's no reason why he wouldn't have. Instead, he steals from the house of God, pays off Syria, and you know what? It works. It works his first time, but that's not the end of it. Let's keep reading. Let's look, let's look at 2 uh, Chronicles 16 in verse number 7. Bible reason, at that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of, Assyria, of Syria escaped out of thy hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host, with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet, because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. So he won that battle against Baasha. The king of Syria came down and they won that battle. Baasha went away. They, you know, the Syrians invaded Israel. And, and distracted him from his campaign against Judah. So he had to just pick up and go back and defend himself against, against his attack from, from the Syrians. But then God sends a prophet. And he's saying, look, you, you, you defeated this huge host because you relied on me. If you would have relied on me again, you would have you defeated him again. But you decided to trust in man instead of in God. And as a result of that, he says, from henceforth, from here forward, you're going to have wars. Now, one of the things I really love, though, is that verse number nine is from that seer. He says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. God is looking high and low. God is looking everywhere to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. See, people wonder, where's God's power today? Why aren't we seeing these great victories? Why aren't we seeing these great miracles and thinking that somehow God's hand is shortened? God's hand is not shortened at all. God's eyes, I believe, are still running to and fro throughout the whole earth. And when it says here, his eyes are searching throughout the whole earth, notice, even in the Old Testament, he wasn't just looking in Israel. He wasn't just looking at the physical seed of Abraham. He was looking throughout the whole earth for anyone to show himself strong through them because their heart is perfect with the Lord. Any group of people that said, the Lord is our God, we're going to follow him with a perfect heart, that people God's going to say, I'm going to show myself strong through you. I'm going to do mighty things. I'm going to cause great miracles. Happen. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to promote you because you're seeking me. God's looking for that. And I believe he's still looking for that today for any people to exalt the Lord and be perfect in following um, toward him, whose heart is perfect toward him. Not, you know, obviously we're not going to be perfect in every aspect, but again, he's looking at the heart. If your heart is perfect toward God, that's what he's looking for, and he'll show himself strong. Look at verse number 10. And this is the result of sin, and we need to watch out for this. Asa was a good king, and he, was still, he still goes down in history. Even though he's made this mistake, He's still revered and regarded in, in the Bible you know, from the Holy Spirit that he was a righteous king. He made a big time mistake here and he was rebuked for it. Okay, But look at what happens. Look at his attitude now as a result of his sin. Then Asa was wroth with the seer. So he's angry with the man of God. The man of God just comes and rebukes him. And 
he's angry. Why is he angry? He, he's angry because really he has a problem with God. The seer is just the messenger. But what does he do? He takes it out on the messenger. You need to be careful about this in your own life. You may be doing great now. Everything's going good. You're fighting for the Lord. You're, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're winning battles. God's with you. You're relying on God. But watch out if one day, you know, take heed that, that, you, that you don't fall. Take heed to yourself. Because one day you might, you might end up getting into some sin and you might be rebuked or reproved and told that you're wrong. Check yourself and check your attitude and don't just get angry at the preacher that says, this is what the Bible says and God says you're wrong and start going after him because your problem's with God. Verse 10, Then Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And notice, you see the fruit of sin. He lost all control. He lost his cool. He lost his temper and just flew off the handle. Because, why? Because he knew he was wrong. And he was angry that anyone's going to call him out. He was lifted up in pride and got angry and threw the preacher into prison. Praise God for the preacher that's willing to stand up and do those things, even to the king's face, and at the risk of being thrown into prison or losing his life. We need more preachers like that. But shame on you if you end up turning on the man of God that's just trying to actually help you and show you your error and give you the rebuke that you might need and, and try to get you right with God. You have two attitudes. When, when, when you hear rebuke, when you hear that you're, you're doing something that's sinful, you could either shut, just shut off and shut down and get angry and get mad and say, I'm not wrong, I'm right, and have that type of an attitude like King Saul had and just stiffen your neck and harden your heart and, and not want to change and not want to humble yourself. Or you can receive it with humility and say, you're right, I sinned, I'm wrong, I screwed up, I'm sorry, God, you know, please forgive me. That's the difference you see between King Saul and King David. That's why you see over and over again King David, whose heart was right with God, because that was the attitude that he ended up having. When he was confronted by Nathan the prophet over his sin with Bathsheba, he humbled himself. He didn't get mad and throw Nathan into prison. He could have. He was the king. He didn't do that. But we see Asa does that. And look at this. What follows. He says he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. Watch yourself in your sins because when you get caught in your sins, if you don't have the right attitude, if you're not humble, you're going to end up taking out on other people. This Hanani, the seer, he didn't deserve any of that. The other people that are, that are being oppressed, they didn't deserve that. Just because Asa's getting up in some sin and now he's angry about it. You know, we need to make sure that we keep ourselves humble and that we can recognize when we do wrong so we don't start going off the handle and just really um, impacting other people that have nothing to do with this. Verse number 11, Behold the acts of Asa first and last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. Go back, if you would, to 1 Kings 15, but keep your, keep your place there in 2 Chronicles. We're going back to it in just a second. 1 Kings 15, 23, the rest of all the acts of Asa and all his might and all that he did and the cities which he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Nevertheless, in the time of his old age, he was diseased in his feet. And Asa slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father, and Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his stead. So again, one small reference in 1 Kings 15 just says, oh, and he was diseased in his feet. And then, and then it just kind of completes the life of Asa. Go back, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 16, because this, this kind of unfortunately shows how Asa ended up just ending his life and the mistakes that he made in his judgment where he started off being really great and relying on God. And then that kind of, his attitude kind of changed in his reliance on the Lord. 2 Chronicles 16, look at verse number 12. And Asa in the 39th year of his reign was diseased in his feet. Remember, he reigned, I think, 41 years. So in the 30, like right near the end, in 39 years, was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease, he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. So even then, even, even when the problem just came, came home to him and he had his own physical ailment, his own problem, this disease that's plaguing his feet, 
he still doesn't get his heart right and just say, you know what, I'm going to seek God first. He goes to man. He goes to the physicians. Now, I am not against physicians in general at all. I mean, the Bible, Luke was the beloved physician. There is, a, there is a reason to have physicians, but we ought to be going to God first with everything. We ought to be going to God, going to God in prayer. God, please heal me. Seek the Lord first. It's not a sin to go and see a physician. I'm not saying don't ever go to a doctor, but you always ought to be going to God. Always, every single time, go to God first. And you also need to be aware that there are physicians of no value. Like Job said, you know, you're all physicians of no value. There's a lot of charlatans out there. There's a lot of people that just because they have MD after their name doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean they're actually going to help you. So just be aware of that. We need to be going to God first. And hey, if you need a physician, see a physician. But don't just rely on physicians to, to help you. Just, just on them. Just like the, the woman that had an issue of blood spent all of her living with the physicians. They couldn't do anything for her. But as soon as she went to Jesus, she touched Jesus, healed of her plague. Her issue of blood staunched, the Bible says. Stopped. Why? Because she sought God. She sought Jesus. And we need to keep that in mind with our own plagues, our own ailments, and things like that, that we're seeking God. And you know what? I, what I believe is happening here is he's easing his feet. God's trying to humble Asa. He's trying to do whatever he can. He's, he's, he's saying, you know what? I'm going to plague him personally, his, his, his feet, you know, whatever. Just, just give him this disease. Will he humble himself and just finally seek me? Because usually that, when, you have, when you have physical problems going on, I know a person, I mean, when I got some pain somewhere, I'm instantly going, to God, please help me with this. Like, this is, this is bad. You got some you know, real bad problems. How could you not go? To, and then this kind of shows you really where his heart was, was going. He was kind of just not wanting to uh, just completely rely on the Lord. So then it says there in verse 13, And Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign. And they buried him in his own sepulchers, which he had made for himself in the city of David, and laid him in the bed, which was filled with sweet odors and diverse kinds of spices, prepared by the apothecary's art, and they made a very great burning for him. So he was, go back if you would to 1 Kings 15. We're going to just close out the chapter now. He was definitely missed. He was a great king. Overall, you know what? He did a lot of good things. He got rid of a lot of the wickedness, a lot of the sin. He set the people's hearts right. He did have, though, a couple of shortcomings in his own life, especially near the end of his life, where he wasn't just completely relying on the Lord. And let's use Asa and learn from him. Let's, let's you know, it's in, the, it's in the Bible for a reason. All these stories, all these words are written down for a reason. It's not just historical fact. It's these things that we can look to and look at to, to gain wisdom ourselves and say, yeah, you, you know, be careful because you could be on fire one moment in your life and doing everything right and winning huge victories and being, you know, spiritually on top of the world, right? And then the next moment, not so much. Getting rebuked, being plagued, having problems. So don't ever allow yourself to get to this place to where you just think you're some spiritual rock star and nothing can ever bring you down. Because that's when you start to get lifted up in yourself and in your pride and you start to forget about God. We need to maintain that humility. So let's finish off this chapter here in 1 Kings 15. Look at verse number 25. The Bible reads, And Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned over Israel two years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. And Baasha, the son of Ahijah, of the house of Issachar, conspired against him. And Baasha smote him at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. For Nadab and all Israel laid siege to Gibbethon. Even in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, did Baasha slay him and reigned in his stead? And it came to pass when he reigned that he smote all the house of Jeroboam. He left not to Jeroboam any that breathed until he had destroyed him, according unto the saying of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite. Because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned and which he made Israel sin by his provocation, wherewith he provoked the Lord God of Israel, to anger. So we remember that a couple weeks ago when Ahijah was basically prophesied when um, Jeroboam's son was sick and 
he sent his wife out disguised to go talk to the man of God. And he knew that she was disguised. And he said, look, your son's going to die. And he's going to be the only one that comes to the grave, basically in peace. He's going to die because there was some good thing found of him. And the, the whole rest of your house, so God's going to take away him that pissed against the wall. Everyone's going to be wiped out. And sure enough, the fulfillment of that happens here with Baasha then killing the king and killing his whole household and just wiping them out. Uh, the prophecy comes to pass. Look at verse number 31. Now the rest of the acts of Nadab and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, began Baasha, the son of Ahijah, to reign over all Israel in Tirzah, twenty and four years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam and his sin, wherewith he made Israel to sin. And you'll notice here, you just we're getting off on that path now. Jeroboam, he introduced those golden calves he introduced those idols, wicked king, wicked king, wicked king. And, they're, and you're going to see over and over again, they're killing each other. They're, there's, there's all these conspiracies and murders going on. And the kingdom is kind of changing from one household to another. It's not established. Why? Because they're all wicked because none of them are following the Lord. Whereas in Judah, you had... King David. You had his household now and Asa and we're going to have Jehoshaphat, another righteous king, and they're establishing their kingdom because they are following the Lord. Whereas kingdom of Israel, they don't have that. There's a lot of turmoil going on. There's a lot of people having to check their back all the time. They're not at peace. Even when they're reigning as a king, there's these conspirators coming up and, and killing them because they're super wicked anyways and, and you know, and usually what you're finding is it's one wicked king killing another wicked king. And we're going to see that next week. I think, it's, I think we're covering like Amri and Zimri next week in the kings of Israel. So again, more, more, of that, uh, more of that next week. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for these great stories in the Bible. God, I hey, pray that you please help us to learn from them. I pray that you please help us to keep humble hearts and that we can could, uh, could look at these people. Lord, help us to have the attitude that, that we're... We've got our hearts perfect towards you so that you could show yourself mighty through us, dear Lord. We, um, we're here. We want to serve you, God. Um, enlighten us. Enlighten our minds. Help us to know the right paths, dear God. And we pray that you would please rebuke us where we need rebuke and that, and that our, our hearts would be right and we wouldn't be puffed up, but that we could humbly receive those corrections and just, and just get ourselves right with you, Lord. We want to see a great work done here. We're confident that you can do it. We know that you're a God who's got, who's got all power. And, and we fully expect to see that power, dear God. As much as we're able to, to keep our hearts right with you, we expect to see a lot of great things done to bring honor and glory unto your name so that you can get more victories, dear God. Please use us to do that here at Word of Truth Baptist Church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.